Hello and welcome to Life Stories with me, Des Tong. Now my guest tonight is an author who currently spends as much time helping others to write as he does writing his own books. Welcome, William Gallagher. Hi, Des. Thank you. Very flashing of you to ask me. I don't feel I've done anything yet. Oh, well, we'll soon find <laughs> That's out. That's true. Okay. <laughs> so, life stories. Mm. Yes. yes. So let's go right back to the beginning. Um, born in Acox Green. Born in Acox Green several years ago. I went to school near there, um, which actually I don't want to name because it wasn't the greatest of schools and I wasn't the greatest of pupils. We kind of found each other that way. Um, and in many ways, I've learnt lessons from it, but none of the ones I think they were meant to teach me. Now, that's strange because I've had two or three guests who've said exactly the same thing. I, I, me, I, you know, as well, um, when I was at school, music wasn't part of the curriculum, and yet, you know, you find your way through, yeah. don't you? So, so, career then, you didn't school wasn't particularly brilliant how did you end up going the way you did it's actually all the fault of a television show it's an american drama called lou grant, lou grant uh, yeah you, oh, edward not, asner yes not very many people remember it i'm uh. impressed <laughs> everybody remembers the show the same company made next though the next show they made was hill street blues right it was uh, it was the first time i was conscious that something was was created and crafted that people had worked on it it wasn't just something playing on in the background and i Looking back, I'm fascinated. It had the technical things they did with the writing, but at the time I was just agog by it, and that was when I thought I wanted to do that. Mm. And I, I'm, I'm realizing I and your previous guests, we must have all gone to the same school. <laughs> uh, but with mine, there was actually a very bad moment in it. Um, you know, the age when you pick your options for careers you're going to have. Mm. We had a careers lesson, and the teacher came in with a big red box. Um, plastic box, like a file index with every job in the world in it. Banged it down on the table, and I must have been first at the front. He said, Mr. Gallagher, he was ready, what do you want to do? And for the first time ever, I actually said writer. I was quite brave, and I, I was like, that's what I want, and it's possible. Somebody can write, I could do this. I want to be a writer, sir. And he laughed at me. Mm. He got the whole class to laugh at me. And I shrugged, I said, well, computers then? Something else I was quite good at at the time. And I later found out he gave me the wrong information about computers as well. But it's astonishing how that one minute in one lesson in school affected me. It took 10 years before I got back to where I think I really only belong. Mm. Yeah, I, I can identify with that, absolutely. Okay, so you mentioned computers. And then I noticed that um, when you uh, first started writing, you, you were writing manuals. Yes, computer manuals. Computer manuals. I, I wrote the manuals that nobody reads. <laughs> well, I, I have to say, I mean, you know, from a music point of view, you buy uh, musical instruments, you know, keyboards and uh, the modules that have all the sounds in that are usually done in Japan, and they make absolutely no sense whatsoever. So, I mean, um, hopefully what you were writing was... A, no, a I wrote bit. in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think mine was as interesting as manuals. I start. I really don't know how I ended up doing it, but I worked first for Apricot, which was a, mm. a big company in Edgebass and Birmingham at the time, it's now long gone. And I don't think I was especially good at it, and I don't think I was writing anything very interesting, but it was good enough that I managed to get a job for McDonnell Douglas, that was based in Solly Hall. No, McDonnell Douglas, the, the planes? Exactly, that's what I thought. In Solly Hall? Yes. It's like no. McDonnell Douglas and Boeing, you know. But Boeing's in Seattle. McDonnell Douglas in Solly Hall? Yep. Yeah. Um, doing well, what so what were you uh, doing? It wasn't aircraft. All right. um, <laughs> How to fly an MD seventy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would have enjoyed that. <laughs> I wrote I think it was eleven manuals about different aspects of local government software. I'm guessing it's a spin-off of all the software IT they did for the aerospace industry, but they created a lot of government pieces. And the thing is it was around the time of the poll tax. Um, and the poll tax is the poll tax, but because I wrote the words community charge and the national non-domestic rate several hundred times, I can't stop thinking of them <laughs> in those euphemistic terms. <laughs> so you went on then from um, manuals, I've got WM down. 
BBC Radio W. Yes. yes, that was a big thing. And my first radio experience was in BHBN, the Birmingham Hospital Broadcasting right. Network. Yes. To a network of 20 hospitals. That's where I met my wife, Angela. That's where I learned a lot. And at just about that time, I was obsessed with radio. I got to do some work experience at Radio WM, and that came on to do other things. I worked on The Breakfast Show for a long time. For quite a while, I was so young. I would get to Radio WM for 4.35, work on the breakfast show, leave about 8.30, just before the show finished, drive to McDonnell Douglas in Solihull, work the day there, and then go on to Focus newspapers a couple of evenings a week. <laughs> oh. That was good. Yeah. Well, that's called dedication. That's called paying your dues. Good point. It was also fun. How could you not do all of those things? They were there, and it was great. I love the fact that um, in McDonald's Douglas you would have a meeting and it was a big discussion about how tight the deadline was and it was seven months. And at Radio WM it, the deadline was the time it takes you to move a fader from the top to the bottom. <laughs> and they each gave you very different perspectives. Yeah, and uh, so th that was what, um, what was the, who was the guy doing the breakfast show at the time? Oh, it changed so much. Um, who was my favourite of it? And is he still around to hear me blank on his name? <laughs> Gordon Astley, of course. Right. Um, actually, I think you moved away from the Midlands not very long afterwards, uh, but a really clever, fast-thinking mm. man. I learnt a lot just watching him, actually. It's, I mean, one of the guys who works here, uh, Gary, Gary James, was, uh, was in yes. radio. And, you know, we do the, the What's On show together. And it is amazing how fast he, he does think. You know, I watch him and, and he, you know, you just get that from radio. Yeah. You, know, you just learn that. So from, from WM, um, you go down to London then. Yeah, have you heard of London? Yeah, it's somewhere uh, down the bottom of the motorway. Yeah, I don't think it's caught on really. No. But no, I went there for a while. I managed to get a job as a features editor on a magazine called PC Direct, now long gone. And uh, to be honest, they shouldn't have hired me. I was atrocious for five or six months. Um, and at the same time, I was very hard trying to get into the BBC, and that I was trying to be a producer, and that all fell apart. And I'm stuck in London, uh, not being very good at this job, not able to get on. And I thought oh, I should really do the job they're paying me for. So it was like put your head down, concentrate, focus. And after a while, I got really good at it. They started giving me more and more sections. I can't remember the page count in the magazine, but by the time I left, I was running 50 pages of a monthly mag, and that meant commissioning writers which is possibly the most useful thing I've ever done as a writer. You see what it's like, and I'm afraid you see how bad writers are. I know I get hired back because I deliver what I agreed when I say I'll, I'll do it, and mm. it's a small thing, but a, a big thing. And it's something that I, I think a lot of people don't realise, is, is that how it, much it takes to write something with a deadline. Mm. You know, you've, you've got to get it right. But, but then you did get into the BBC, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, I got so successful at PC Direct that I realised I was writing less and less. In the end, I would write only the dull articles that I couldn't find a writer to do. And that was fun. You would learn about accountancy software for a month and then get it all out of your head and go on to backup storage solutions and something. <laughs> but it was all... A bit. And computers at that time, it was one grey box after another, and I just I couldn't get excited that this week's one was half a percent faster than last week's one. So I managed to get a tiny bit of work. I'd pitched to a television show called Micro Live uh, at the BBC, and I got a little item on there, writing and behind the scenes, but I'd seen it in action, had the taste for it. I pitched to lots of different parts of the BBC, and somehow I ended up doing just a tiny bit of work on the BBC homepage. Um, but bbc.co.uk, the front page used to be its own little editorial magazine. Mm. Uh, I actually remember I'd gone freelance from PC Direct. I was trying to get into drama and entertainment writing. It was looking promising, but it wasn't happening. And I instead, I was doing a lot of technology reviews. I interviewed the head of Microsoft UK, based in Reading. And I remember standing at Reading train station I just missed a train, it's going to be an hour before I got home. I'm thinking, is this my freelance life? Because <laughs> whoever that guy is at Microsoft, he was, he acted as if he had invented Windows and Word. And I think, you just run the UK off. There's the staggering arrogance <laughs> in that building. And you're trying to be nice and ask interesting questions. And I honestly thought, maybe I made the wrong choice. Um, I had a phone call. Um, actually, that first phone call, it came from the BBC, uh, BBC Co UK, via Radio Times. I'd approached Radio Times, Radio Times had said, 
we've got nothing doing, we'll keep you on our books. And he never believed that. But Arabian a year Times. later, somebody at the BBC asked them and they recommended me. So I covered for somebody's absence for a week or two. And the thing with being a freelance is you're used to just getting in, doing the job and going out. Yeah. Uh, because I didn't know what the guy I was covering usually did, I found out at the end I'd done about six weeks of work in the time he'd done it. <laughs> so yeah. they asked me back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this boy's keen. Yes. <laughs> OK, so, right, we're going to pause there because we're going to take a break. But um, afterwards, um, I want to talk about um, Doctor Who. Doctor Who. That be fun. OK, so... Join us after the break, myself and William Gallagher. Welcome back to Live Stories with me, Des Tong, and my guest, William Gallagher. Now, when we left just before, we were, you were down in London, uh, you were just getting your nose into the Radio Times, which I've got to say, I mean, the Radio Times is... I know, isn't it? It's such a special thing. Yeah. I remember the first editorial meeting I went to there, I went in quite cocky because I'm a TV drama nut, I know this stuff. I'm sitting around the table with these very nice, ordinary, normal people who know everything, <laughs> everything. I was, I was a kid in the corner in that one, but in a nice way, and I learnt immensely from them. Radio Times, uh, it's very quite messy, actually. BBC Co UK came from Radio Times, but BBC Co UK led to CFAX, works in the CFAX newsroom. CFAX, that's oh, another yes. great institution. Yeah, and BBC News Online, that's, mm. that one's still going, at mm. least. CFAX has unfortunately finished. How, how many hours did you used to spend watching it, waiting for it to come round again? Yes. So you could, because you missed, just got the end of it, and you had to wait all the time for it to come back. I wrote <laughs> 16,000 pages of CFAX, <laughs> and I remember every one. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Radio Times, BBC and CFAX, they all blurred together, and there was one gorgeous moment at Television Centre in London when I came around the corner and I found my three editors. They just bumped into each other, and at that moment they just found out I worked for all of them, and they were comparing notes. <laughs> I never found out what they said, mm. but they looked guilty. <laughs> now then, I've got written down crossroads exclamation mark yeah we we can skip that though can we? <laughs> no no i want to hear i want to hear i was hired on crossroads in 2001 um, when it first came back and i was fired from crossroads <laughs> slightly later in 2001 <laughs> uh it was an experience i actually thought that was the type of drama i would love doing because I, by then i was newsroom trained and it was very fast to turn around for it uh but the straight answer is my script just wasn't good enough um yeah. so i was out the door although actually the bravest thing i think i've ever done in my writing career is that i was in a bbc newsroom when the episode i was supposed to write aired and everyone else had gone out to lunch i put the little headphones on you're supposed to monitor all the news channels but i nudged it over to itv mm -hmm. and i watched crossroads right. and the very first line was one i'd written and the second, and the third, oh. and the, about 90% of it was exactly as I'd written. Yeah. Uh, and at the time, I felt very smug. I thought, well, obviously, I did it right. Now I think they just didn't have time to fix it. Probably, <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> so then, OK, so you, you now you're teetering into uh, writing for scripts and that. Um, but you're still writing for newspapers. I, I, yes. I've got here... Um, the Independent, little bits, little and, bits independent and the or? L.A. Times. I know. Tell me the Los L.A. Times. Angeles. Well, the horrible thing about this story is that now online people can look up and see how <laughs> tiny the thing was. But it's in the Times, in the Los Angeles Times. And that's especially important to me because Lou Grant, that started me off, was based on the L.A. Times oh, for okay. it. Um, so. I remember bringing a copy of that, of, of the L.A. Times, back when I was over there. And it, it, it filled my bag. Yes. <laughs> It made the times look like a rag, you know, it was huge. They would have loved hearing you say that. Right. Even in the, the time I was there, you know, passing through, they were saying, you don't want to go to the times in New York. No, it's terrible. Stay here. <laughs> <laughs> so, now then, here we come to the big one. Doctor Who. Yes, Doctor Who. Who would have thought I'd get to, I'd get to write Doctor Who? I, I am a radio drama nut. I'm a drama nut. I love Doctor Who growing up, so this is, is a perfect storm. And it's actually the fault of Radio Times. Again, I owe them so much. Um, for a long time, there was a sister title. Where there was a title called, a magazine called Doctor Who Adventures. 
There's still Doctor Who Monthly, which is the incredibly famous long-running magazine. Uh, this one is specifically BBC for younger children. And the age range varied, but it was about six to nine when I was on it. And uh, they're in the same building as Radio Times. They needed someone to cover again the shift. And I think, I think I was the only one who applied for it who didn't apply because it was Doctor Who. I already knew my Doctor Who stuff. What I wanted was to learn how to write for children, because I'd done adults a lot. I thought children were a very difficult audience. And that, plus the fact that I knew magazines, again, I got a gig covering somebody's absence. Um, and Murray Lang, who was editor at the time, uh, you can't talk to me more than 30 seconds before knowing I'm into radio. And he put me, uh, put me in touch with Big Finish, the company that makes Doctor Who uh, dramas under license from the BBC. And just like that, two years later, they came back to me and said, listen, actually, maybe we could do something. Mm. Are you still interested? And I can see me at the gig getting that email, thinking, play it cool, play it professional. <laughs> and do yes. Okay. <laughs> and the Biderbeck affair, now I remember that. That was, was that a film or was it a series? It was originally a six-part series on right. ITV in the early 80s, but it aired in 1984, five time. It's written by Alan Plater, um, who's uh, famous for about 300 scripts, Z cars, mm -hmm. uh, books as well, a lot of theatre, a lot of some incredible radio for it. And actually, my first ever magazine piece, even before Radio Times, was interviewing Alan about the Biderbeck affair for the British Film Institute's uh, then television magazine. 20 years later, my first book was writing about Alan and the Biderbeck affair for the British Film Institute. So it's always been part of my career, but also I became friends with Alan and his wife, Shirley Rubenstein, and they, they were just friends for a long time and they helped me a lot more through osmosis and just seeing. I don't want to say that he was like a mentor to me because he was mentor, he did more of that with more people, more famous writers than I did. But what I learned from him has affected everything I've written, and I can see him in what I try to write, at least. And around about this time, you got into blogging. Now, I mean, yes. you must have been one of the first bloggers. I think I must have been, yes. It's well, kind of, it peaked and it waned. I think it's coming back again now, and yeah. I've stayed there all yeah. the way through. Because, I, I mean, I remember uh, tr writing a couple of things. I think I was ranting on about uh, people nicking royalties off you know, musicians and things like that. But it, it never really got very far. But I know that there are certain people who, write, when they write blogs, everybody reads them. Yes. I don't think I'm in that level. Oh, I think you are. Oh, you're so nice. Under, <laughs> underestimating yourself there. <laughs> the, the blog came out of the fact that I used to... I had a column on Radio Times. Uh, I had a, a complicated column on this day. So I had seven mini columns in every issue. Then I had a column on News Online. And those went away. And I needed that deadline. Uh, so I created one by having a blog I would do most weeks. I was doing a podcast at the time called UK DVD Review, which I love saying was in the, it genuinely was in the top 10 of all podcasts of all categories in the world. At the time, there were only nine podcasts. <laughs> but the blog started as, uh, you know, show notes of what went on that. Yeah. And then that carried on. And it's, it's now become a thing called Self Distract, mm. which is about writing and writers. And out of that has come a blogging book through which I got to meet some of those people who wrote some amazing blogs. And I get to teach about it. Actually, well, teaching is a strange word. I don't feel like I'm teaching. I'm just showing people things. And look, isn't it great? And actually, that, I see that with my journalism and my workshops and things. I found something I can't wait to show you about it. And then we can go do it together and things. And that's how all that sign of works together in my head. And, you know, blogging, so how do you go about it? You know, what, what do, you, do you find a, a subject and then just expand on that subject? Or, or is it, do you get ideas? Do people give you ideas? Uh, I am paid to blog somewhere, and occasionally uh, the people who pay me will say, could you please do it about this particular topic? But generally, uh, I created the deadlines myself, I fit the deadlines myself, and it's the usual thing of writing to any deadline, you have to find something. But it's really interesting that you say it that way because I think a massive problem with blogs, including mine years ago, was that they went all over the place. You ranted about royalties one week, you might have gone on about, I don't know, uh, your personal private yacht the <laughs> next, uh, and there was no coherence to it, there was no reason for anybody to come back. When there is even a small through line 
you are talking about the same types of things, mm. especially if you're not talking about yourself. I think it can become, it can become very interesting. At the beginning, I said that uh, you now spend as much time teaching yes. other people, and especially young people. I know you're, invo you're involved in the young writers and, and the writer skill. Yes, um, which I think is amazing. I mean, I, I enjoy the youth in music, so it must be great for, to be involved in, in youth with, with writing. It's invigorating. I was in a school last week and the kids do that thing of asking me questions and it was um, something to do with where do I get my inspiration from? And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, well, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> I've had uh, 108 year olds yelling exterminate at me and it genuinely <laughs> made my ears ring. Young Writers is uh, uh, part of Writing West Midlands uh, an organization I do a lot of work with and I deeply admire and adore. I, just, I mean, I just like the people, but also what they do. They do 300 events a year. And so for adults, there's the Birmingham Literature Festival, there's the new National Writers Conference, but then everything else, or well, so much else is for young writers. And um, every month I go to rugby to work with a group of eight to about 14 year olds, uh, cooking up whatever we can find. Mm, it's be fascinating. I, I know I've I've actually been to a school with you and yes, and seen you in in action. And it's, yeah, uh, fortunately, I went before you. <laughs> I couldn't follow you. <laughs> <laughs> William, it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you. Well, um, long may it continue. And, yes, uh, thank I feel you. like in the first fifty years were dull. I'm just starting now. Uh, I'd like to say thank you so much for coming on the show. So join me, Destung, again for another one of my guests on Live Stories.